Thank you. What a fantastic night it's been. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's worth all the stress just to get a free ticket, I have to say. Um, <laughs> um, so, thinking forward, that's the theme. And my response is this. To move forward progressively, we should not live in the past, but we can learn from and we should be inspired by it. I'm going to talk to you about the International Fair Trade Towns movement, and in particular, how I've been personally inspired by the abolition of the um, British transatlantic slave trade and the pioneers who, um, who made it happen in the first place. So it was the Garstang Oxfam group that actually started the Fair Trade Towns campaign. Um, and we had our first meeting back in 1992, which was attended by just three people. There was myself, who was the chair, my wife, who was a secretary, and we had our babysitter. <laughs> and I'd like to say that we sat round the table to create an international movement of change, but I'd be lying. We were just three people who cared passionately about wanting to see a change in the world, wanting to see an end to poverty. And I know when I travel around the world, which I have the privilege to do these days, and I meet so many, particularly young people, trade justice campaigners, who feel frustrated. Because in those early days, we were frustrated. We had very few successes, lots and lots of frustrations. So I know how those people feel. But there is hope when you consider that just three people can actually meet together and lead to an international movement for change that now consists of over 1,600 fair trade towns in 25 countries across the world. But perseverance does pay off. I would say if you bang your head against the brick wall for long enough, the wall will eventually fall, but it will lead you with a hell of a headache. So it does pay off, and in April of, 19, um, sorry, April of 2000, at a public meeting in Garstang, the people of Garstang voted to make their town the world's first fair trade town. And following on from that, George Fawkes, who was then the Under Secretary of State for the Department for International Development, he said, the immortal words, the beacon that has started in Garstang can spread like wildfire through the whole country and beyond. The criteria to become a fair trade town were developed, which I won't bore you with now, they're there for all to see on the website, and it became possible for other towns to follow in Garstang's footsteps. There are now 604 fair trade towns in the UK, including just about every single city you can think of, and especially Lancaster. As George Fawkes said, fair tree towns started to spread across the globe. And these are all the first fair tree towns across the world in all the 25 countries. The last country to come on board was Estonia last year in 2014 when they launched their fair tree town campaign. And these are all the first fair tree towns, oh, sorry, these are all the numbers of fair tree towns in all the countries across the globe. We now have a total of 1,622 in 25 countries, and that's going up by day by day. Now, about the same time that we became a fair trade town, we had this um, project called Fair Trade Slave Trade. And the idea was it linked Garstang as the first fair trade town, along with Lancaster, which is the fourth largest, or was the fourth largest slave trade port, together with Ghana. And Ghana is the place where the cocoa for this chocolate, divine fair trade chocolate, if you've ever tasted it, it's absolutely wonderful, um, actually comes from, but also, of course, the place where the slaves were, were, were taken from uh, to go across the ocean. And from that link, uh, from that project, we actually formed a link between Garstang and the cocoa farming community of New Coforidea. As time went on, the people in New Coforidea themselves worked to become the first fair tree town in the whole of Africa. We then extended our link to form up with a place called Media in Pennsylvania, in the USA, who themselves were the first fair tree town in the whole of the American continents. So you have this beautiful triangular relationship between these first fair trade towns, which we call the fair trade triangle. And very appropriately, but totally coincidentally, they form the same three corners of the infamous slave trade triangle of the past. This link between the fair trade and slave trade that we have now is the underlying theme for the Fig Tree Center, the International Fair Trade Center that we set up in Garsing in 2011. And then earlier this year, it moved to this church, which I hope at least some of you recognize, it's called St. John's, and it's just around the corner here from Dukes. And we set up there. And again, rather appropriately, this church was built on money from the slave trade back at the height of Lancaster's slave trade period. Now, I don't suspect there's probably anybody in the room who knows this, um, but there might be somebody watching on streaming who knows it, particularly if they're from Ghana. But this is a Ghanaian Adinkra symbol. 
And again, going back to this lovely bar of divine chocolate, you'll see all these patterns on here. They're not just patterns. They are all Garnet and Adinkra symbols. They all have a meaning. And this one, you'll see at the bottom here, right at the bottom of this bar, and it's called Sankofa. And Sankofa is the local Ghanaian language for the Shanti people in Ghana called Twi, um, and it means return and get it. And it symbolizes a bird looking back on its tail. And it means, quite simply, we can learn from the past. We can learn from history. And throughout history, whether it's the British Atlantic slave trade abolition or whether it's the end of apartheid more recently in South Africa, it's always been ordinary people that makes that change. Ordinary people on the streets. Admittedly, you have to look at the abolition of the slave trade. Politicians are often the ones who take the credit. And undoubtedly, in fair game, you know, William Wilberforce did a lot to get the abolition of the slave trade through. But what doesn't often get recognised is the millions of people on the streets, not just in Britain but around the world, petitioning, campaigning to make that happen, to gather the evidence and the materials that William Wilberforce needed to get that act passed. And it's the same for apartheid. I remember when apartheid ended in South Africa, Nelson Mandela came over to this country and, um, uh, and he congratulated the millions of people right across the globe and thanked them for, ha for making that happen. He was never the first to take the credit for what happened. He said it was due to those people across the globe who all did their little bit. And again, Nelson Mandela came across to Britain again in 2005 to launch the Make Poverty History Rally. And that's when he said that like slavery and apartheid, Poverty is not natural, it is man-made, and therefore it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. Poverty is man-made, therefore it's totally unacceptable. And therefore, all of us have a duty to act against it. It's not charity, it's not something we do for the goodness of our hearts, it's a duty. Now the slave trade abolitionists were not just the pioneers of the abolition campaign, they were really the pioneers of campaigning as we know it today. We're using the same tools that they invented, that they created. This coin on the left here, with the kneeling slave, and it has the words, am I not a man and a brother to you? This was called by, by Oxfam as being the first Make Poverty History white band. This was the first campaign tool. People carried that tool to show that they were an abolitionist. I carry one very proudly in my wallet wherever I go today. This is the very first white band. And again, we're talking about looking forward, thinking forward. It's amazing to think that 200 years ago, at a time when women, never mind having the vote, they weren't even allowed into meetings like this, they weren't even allowed into places to discuss issues, and yet they had the same coin with a woman on, am I not a woman and a sister to you? That's what you call thinking ahead, thinking forward. And the women, of course, at that time, again, were paramount. Even though they didn't have the vote, they were on the streets campaigning, they were getting petitions signed. And most importantly, even way back then, they took consumer action by boycotting sugar produced by slaves, which was a major part in making that abolition happen, and yet something that so little recognised today. So during the slave trade abolition, we had men and women young and old, black and white, across all creeds, across all cultures, across all faiths, fighting for something that they knew, fighting against something they knew to be morally wrong. And their message was very clear. It is simply immoral that people should be allowed to suffer to providers of luxuries like tea, coffee and sugar at a cheap price. Sadly, that message is still relevant today. And I don't just mean by contemporary slavery. I'm talking about the fact that these people in Ghana grind cocoa for our chocolate. They don't even have access to clean drinking water. That is quite simply immoral. And again, we must act against it. Fair Trade Towns unites ordinary people, men and women, young and old, black and white, across all creeds, faiths and cultures against, uh, in the fight for fairer trade and trade justice. The beauty of the thing about fair trade towns is it goes across all communities. It involves all aspects of the community. And what that means is it's about you. It's not about the person sitting next to you or about your neighbour back home. It's about you. Every single one of you in this room, all the people watching in their homes or wherever they are, it's about every single one of you. You can get involved with a fair trade town campaign near to you, and if there isn't one there, you can start one up. Thank you very much.